this is Pamela Weiss. Um, I am a pediatric rheumatologist from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia uh, and also a faculty member at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I am also fortunate to sit on the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board um, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the SAA. And I'm delighted to talk to you for a few minutes today uh, to talk to you about the treatment strategies for children with spinal arthritis and peripheral disease. Um, and this talk is primarily intended for parents. So as a reminder, when we talk about peripheral disease manifestations in juvenile spinal arthritis, we're primarily referring to enthesitis and arthritis. And you may or may not understand the difference between these two terminologies. Enthesitis is tenderness or inflammation where the tendons and ligaments attach to the bone. This is a process that occurs outside the joint, as opposed to arthritis, which talks about inflammation of the joint. This is an inside the joint process. Enthesitis tends to be episodic or it can also be chronic. It more often affects the lower extremities. It is often worse after activities. So this is the nighttime pain that kids experience when they've been running around trying to be normal active kids and they feel like they've been run over by a truck. Many of these children, but not all of them, will also have accompanying morning stiffness and gelling. In contrast, arthritis um, is usually better with activity. So these are the kids that uh, wake up in the morning, they feel like they're 90 years old, it's hard for them to get moving. The more they move, the better they feel. Just like enthesitis, this typically affects the lower extremities, though of course there are lots of children who have NPCs and, are, uh, and joints that are affected in the upper extremities as well. The vast majority of children with spinal arthritis have what we call oligoarticular disease, where, more, uh, where less than four joints are affected. Um, and uh, Enthesitis and arthritis can occur at the same time. They can also occur independent of each other. So your child might have arthritis that's very well controlled, but enthesitis that's really causing a problem or vice versa. Arthritis is almost always an inflammatory process. Enthesitis can be inflammatory and associated with spinal arthritis, but it's also important to recognize that enthesitis happens in children without spinal arthritis. And this can also happen from overuse um, injuries such as with high intensity sports. Um, so for those of you that are a little less uh, familiar with what enthesitis is, this is just a picture um, of the joint and the surrounding ligaments. Um, and on this part right here, you can see the enthesis is where this tendon attaches to the bone here. So when we talk about enthesitis, we're talking about pain here. Again, this is an outside the joint process. When we're talking about arthritis, we're talking about this area in here where the bones meet and the, the joint moves back and forth. So areas um, that children are often very tender uh, for enthesitis are these areas. So this is along the bottom of the foot. These are the areas where something called the plantar fascia or the web that runs on the bottom of your feet attached to the heel um, and to the sole of the foot. This area here is where the Achilles tendon attaches. Here, this dot is representing where the hip flexors attach into the bone. This is a common site involved. Here at the top of the kneecap is where the quadriceps tendon inserts, and here's where the infrapatellar tendon inserts, and back here is, um, is your sacroiliac joint where you have lots of um, different ligaments running back and, cross, back and forth across the joint. So treatment of enthesitis, which again is our number one peripheral uh, disease manifestation that we'll talk about first, um, often focuses on not as much pharmacotherapy, but lots of times on, on other treatments such as stretching and physical therapy. If children have tenderness, especially of their plantar fascial insertions on, uh, on the heel or the Achilles tendon on the back of the heel, shoe inserts, flexible heel cups, or orthotics tend to be tremendously helpful. Um, I get asked by parents all the time, should they ice it or should they put warm compresses on it? I usually say, you know, traditionally ice is the thing to cause them inflammation down. Lots of children think heat also helps because that relaxes their muscles. My usual stance is whatever makes your child feel better is what you should do. Oftentimes, if enthesitis is the only thing that's bothering your child, we will recommend the use of non-steroidals. These are medications in the IV profen 
family and medicines that you may hear us talk about are things like diclofenac, indomethacin, peroxicam. These are all just different flavors of the same family. Um, if the enthesitis is not responsive to non-steroidals, we may increase the treatment to include disease modifying agents such as sulfazalazine or methotrexate. And then if the enthesitis still is uncontrolled, other things that we can um, think about using are anti-tumor necrosis factor inhibitor medications, um, as uh, all of these different classes of medicines have been shown to be effective. The other manifestation that I wanna to talk to you about is the arthritis and the treatment of that. So again, oligoarticular disease uh, affects four or fewer joints. Uh, when we see a child that only has one or two joints, we try to treat, treat it locally and spare the child from, uh, from exposure to systemic agents. So on the left, you'll see, uh, we'll typically talk to you about uh, intraarticular steroid injections, and this is with a long acting steroid. Um, the steroid that we use typically lasts anywhere from three to six months. Um, if additional joints become affected, or if we find that we're having to repeat steroid joint injections over and over again, particularly on the same joint, we usually then talk to you about more systemic medication. So non-steroidal drugs, again, of the ibuprofen family, such as naproxen, diclofenac, paroxicam, these drugs can also be helpful in the short term for oligoarticular disease by themselves. They don't usually um, solve the process. I think of them more as like a band-aid. They're going to make your child feel better until we're able to get them more definitive treatment. Systemic therapy, uh, when again, you need repeat joint injections and there's multiple joints being added on, is typically methotrexate, sulfasalazine, or leflunamide. So going through each of these um, systemic medicines in just a little bit more detail so you're familiar with what you might hear in the office. Sulfazalazine has been around for a long time. It's an oral medication. It's typically twice a day. This medication does not work overnight, so you need to be patient. Typically, we see a response within four to six weeks. Uh, the occurrence of side effects is relatively frequent. Um, about 20% of children and adults who are on this medication develop side effects. Um, and they usually include abdominal pain or stomach upset, um, rash, dropping blood counts, or infection. Methotrexate um, is probably the most frequently used. This comes in two forms, injection or oral. Um, many pediatric rheumatologists like myself prefer to use the injectable form of this medication at least up front, um, as we can use higher dose of it, and it, doses of it. It tends to be more effective in terms of its absorption into the body. Um, and there are fewer side effects than with the oral version. Lots of times, once kids come under really good control, if the injections are um, a real hindrance and, and um, the kids are scared of the injections, at that point in time, uh, I will offer to them to switch them over to the oral form. For little kids, the solution for injection can be given orally if needed. Um, Usually when we start people on methotrexate, we also start them with a folic acid supplement that can either be folic acid by itself um, or folic acid um, within a multivitamin. Like sulfazalazine, this is not a medication that works overnight. Typically we see initial response within six to 12 weeks. Um, as with any systemic medication, this medicine also comes with risk. And typically what we're looking for are rise in liver enzymes. This is typically transient and very responsive to a reduction of dose. It's much more rare in children versus adults. Um, if you Google this medicine, you may read about lung toxicity, which is extremely rare in children. The most common side effects and the ones that you will hear about from your kids are sometimes they're a little bit nauseous 24 hours after the administration. And we have about 50 tricks up our sleeves to make this go away. We're trying to solve problems, not cause new ones. So let your pediatric rheumatologist know um, if you're having trouble with this. Um, and like any, uh, any of the systemic immunosuppressants, there's an increased risk of infection. Lastly, we'll talk about leflunamide. Um, this also is an older medication like sulfazalazine. Usually we don't use this as a first line agent unless children are unable to tolerate methotrexate. This is oral, it's a once a day medicine, and it has the same response time as methotrexate and sulfazalazine. Side effects are also fairly similar and consists of abdominal pain, diarrhea, reflux symptoms. They can also get a rise in liver enzymes. Um, this one, uh, and I forgot to mention this for methotrexate, can both cause birth defects. 
Um, and this one actually stays in the body for a very long time. So we typically don't like to use lufonamide, um, in, especially in girls who are um, thinking about having um, babies in a few years. And similar to the other two medications we talked about, there is a risk of infection. In children who have more uh, joints affected, so five or more joints, the treatment is a little bit different. We don't typically offer joint injections unless there is one or two particular joints that are really, really bothering the kids. Say they're playing a sport and they can't participate in soccer because their knee is swollen or they can't write in school because their dominant wrist is swollen. At that point in time, we'll, ask, we'll offer to inject the joints because those joints will then feel better within 24 to 72 hours. But those children with more than four joints are really going to need a systemic medication. And for treatment of this, we typically start with one of the disease modifying agents that I just talked to you about, methotrexate sulfasalazine or loflunamide. And sometimes depending on the severity of disease and or the joints involved, we will also talk to you about adding a biologic. The most commonly used are the TNF inhibitor medications, tanercept, adalimumab, and fliximab. Um, and then more recently, tocilizumab has also been approved in children for polyarticular disease. Also paramount here is that physical and occupation, occupational therapy can be extremely helpful for children in terms of helping them to regain their mobility and confidence in their joints. So in terms of biologics, this term scares a lot of families and children. This just really means it's a much more targeted therapy than some of the disease modifying agents that you've already heard about. Um, all, of the, uh, all of the biologics that we have on the market right now uh, for children are injectable medications. Um, Etanercept is a weekly subcutaneous shot that you would give at home. Humira is an every other week subcutaneous shot, again, given at home. Infliximab is given by IV uh, initially at zero, two, and six weeks, and then every four to week, eight weeks um, by infusion thereafter. This can be either given at home by a home nursing agency or at a local infusion center. And then uh, tocilizumab, which is the newest drug that got approved for polyarticular arthritis, is uh, every other week's so cutaneous shots, again, that you can give at home. Response for the biologics is typically much faster than with the traditional disease-modifying agents, often within one month. For all of these drugs, uh, side effects are, are relatively rare, but what we do look for is dropping blood counts, infections, site injection reactions, um, for tocilizumab, we also need to monitor cholesterol and triglycerides. Um, for all of these, even though children are relatively low risk for tuberculosis, the FDA mandates that we check them for tuberculosis before starting. Um, because if you take these medicines and you have tuberculosis living in your lungs, it will, uh, it will come out. Um, and then there's a black box warning against the use of TNF inhibitors in children. And that is because um, when these drugs uh, first came out, there were some very rare cancers that were reported um, in patients who were taking TNF inhibitors in combination uh, with certain drugs used for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, since that time, uh, multiple large population-based studies have been done um, in children with JIA, um, showing that we think the very, very slight increased risk of cancer is not from the TNF medication itself. It's likely from the underlying disease. Um, and a slight increased risk of cancer is a phenomenon that we, we see and we know about in adult rheumatoid arthritis. And so we think there's a very similar process in children. And most pediatric rheumatologists uh, think that the benefit that children can receive from uh, taking these biologics far, far, far exceeds the, uh, the, the risk um, that we see uh, and that are reported here. That is your primer on the treatment of peripheral disease manifestations for juvenile spinal arthritis.